Gunilla, uh, you grew up in Sweden. Uh, and uh, I note somewhere in something that you, in an interview that you had, that you mentioned that um, uh, growing, uh, growing up in Sweden, in some respects, put you in touch with a nostalgia for the infinite. In fact, I think you said that it's typical of Swedes that they have a nostalgia for the infinite. I'm using that uh, really as a premise because I'm wondering, if I ask the question, what caused you, uh, what brought you into the thought of becoming an artist, or did you in fact have the thought of becoming an artist? Um, uh, whether this notion or this, uh, whether this sense of the infinite somehow played into this idea that you could be an artist. I say that because in some respects, art is often linked to thoughts such as the infinite and also such as nostalgia. I just wonder if either of these notions played into why you became an artist. Well, if, if um, I think about myself, how I was when I was young, what kind of person I was and how my emotional state was and, and uh, my, psycho my psychology and, and uh, in relationship to other people, I know that I I've always known that I am uh, alone and it's not because there aren't any other people, it's because uh, I'm kind of part of another, I would say realm, but it's just an emotional state really. And um, I suppose there's nostalgia in that, in the sense that there is longing, and you never know what that longing is, and you, you don't... Uh, well, when you're young, you think there is nostalgia there, but I'm not going back for it, I'll go forward with it. And uh, then, um, at some point, um, I started developing a need to to do something with my hand and which had to do with my brain of course and my emotional state and um, that started early I had no idea I was going to be that I didn't know that was an, an artistic impulse then I'm not even sure now that there is, there is an artistic impulse actually but uh, um, you know, some people in that, if some people with that inclination would, would start thinking about God, right? But it, that was, it was not available for me. I did try it though. I was kind of religious when I was 15. I went through a period of, of religiousness uh, and um, wanted to be, con be confirmated, which is not that common in Sweden. And then the night before the confirmation, my parents discovered that I wasn't christened. So, so the priest called actually and said, you, your daughter can't be confirmated because she's not Christian. So I had to be Christian and confirmation at the same time. It became a big deal and um, um, it became too social and I think I couldn't be alone in that at all. So I kind of dropped that and I never did find a god or whatever. So, but... Um, Yes, uh, so that the, so painting then, I was just using watercolor mostly, was, satisfac was, satis was satisfactory and gave me pleasure, but I, I, I didn't know why. Uh, I'm reminded, just thinking about God, if we can just briefly return to God, um, something wonderful that uh, Kierkegaard once mentioned, um, that if you wanted to understand God, if you wanted to understand the infinite, you should take a small boat and row out two kilometers into the ocean and look down. And he said, then you will understand the notion of the infinite. Oh. Have you, have 
you done that? I haven't, but I cast myself back to my childhood, being in a small boat, not in the ocean, but mm -hmm. in a lake, I guess, looking down and feeling a sense of, I guess, the infinite. Yeah. <clears throat> It's a kind of um, almost like um, substi substitute depth, I think. When you, when you look down and you have this uh, almost like vertigo, same feeling of swaying or... And also I think the beauty of that experience would be related to uh, infinity for me. And um, it's, you know, today you can't really talk about beauty. You, you come into... Um, slippery waters at once, so it's, it's not really anything I want to talk about here. So do you think that there is a relationship between the notion of infinity and the uh, practice of art? Uh, is there a connection that would, in some respect, stitch the idea of what an artist does uh, together uh, between these two concepts, God notwithstanding? just the notion of the infinite. Uh, um, well, you know, the Nostalgia of the Infinite is actually a book by Tarkovsky, so that brings me over to his, uh, mm -hmm. to his uh, practice. And he was religious, mm -hmm. so I helped him. But so was Eisenstein. Eisenstein so. Um, well, of course it is. I think. I mean, I, I, I don't know how this this thing distinguish between um, existential longing, melancholy, uh, sadness, uh, and even joy. I mean, these are all emotional states, and but it also involves psychology. And and uh, can I say that I I am an artist to. I'm not an artist so that I can heal myself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. That's not, also not a good statement. But I think that all artists have thoughts that are longer in the sense, uh, or are, uh, are in states, can put themselves in states of mind and, and uh, thought that, um, where this inquisitiveness kind of meets uh, the longing, and and then, then you, you. It's a kind of research in a sense, but it's more like to me. It's, it's a re an emotional research, a research into humanity and to understand who we are, and, and uh, also what reality is. And I mean, this can maybe that feeds. This, you, it's fed by those longer, um, lonely moments of asking yourself. Um, what it is, and I think the role of artists is always to try and explain what uh, reality is, if not to ourselves, then that if not to others, at least to ourselves, and it's a way to sort it out somehow. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, you've mentioned, Yuganella, um, that uh, central to your and this is, I think, related to the more general question or abstract question of the role of the artist, but more personalized, that your encounter with the world was what drives you forward in your practice. Would I be mistaken in assembling that quotation in this context? No, it's, 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 it's accurate for sure. Um, um, The world around me informs me, like everybody else. I look at it and I, I, I live in it, and I, and and and, and then I, I, um, and then I, um, um, I, I don't know what triggers, a, you know, an idea or a thought. It could be, it could be a material. It could be. It could be a, a movement, or it could be music. I mean, all that, all that is real. It can, it can also be texture. And wh why it triggers something in me, I don't know. 
but it does, and I think I'm, I'm just like everybody else there. I think that's not unusual, but maybe most people don't think that they need to do something with that. And sometimes that will be a relief. And I often talk to my partner about, or we talk about, why can we never just go into nature and lie down and, and sort of enjoy and fall asleep, have a nap, read a book, or you know, go to the beach? No, it always involves like, what is it? Who are we? And uh, you get no, I mean, it's, it's not serene. I mean, it's, it looks, it sounds like it could be serene to want to be in touch with the turtle, but it's absolutely not serene. It's very, it's very intense most of the time. On the question of intensity um, and thinking about whether you're like everybody else, uh, you've also mentioned that your aim is to disrupt norms, construct resistances to, uh, or comment on the tyranny of orthodoxy. And I'm wondering if that um, demanding purpose uh, would form the core to your practice. Um, yeah, I've, I've formulated that over the years, and I think um, I think it's the core of my practice, and that has to do also with psychology and my past and my upbringing and and how I see the world and how what what fails for us to be real and for other people to be real and how a kind of cosmetic world kind of cosmetics meaning that um, you have to be in a certain way all the codes are written and everything the laws and and civil civil codes are good and they should be followed but you know even there it's it's a it's not a given all the time uh, i see myself as a bit of a wild card i think i, I would not see myself i was i, I um like my parents thought I was difficult, and and uh, that my 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 imagination was an exaggeration that they kind of worried about, and they somehow connected to my left-handedness also. So I had to sit for a summer and learn to write with my right hand, which never happened after that. You touch on feminism there because I think there are more rules have been always and are is still more rules and, and the limitations for women have to move around in the world for sure. And I have concentrated to some extent or to a great extent on women and their the requirement of uh, for good behavior or means meaning look good very often. We live in this world of advertising and the, the ideal of a woman and the lingering on, on our faces especially in the film industry where there is hardly a film in, 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 whether it's Tarkovsky or Godard or whoever it is usually a woman's face is absolutely necessary and, and um, it's irritating to see that they're always to me they're similar because they're even faces and they're they're, they're you know photogenic and and they're um, considering that historically that most men mostly make the films, it is kind of um, entertainment for the men, and the, or for viewers. And I think that uh, uh, misbehavior is a lot more interesting than good behavior. And I, I think that I've always felt that way. In fact, it's the world that's difficult, not yourself. Uh, well, if that's a strong thought, and you know, I would like to. Yes, I do. Th I do think that in, in some aspects, and that's why I work with, with with the idea of coming to some kind of more naked truth or naked statement of who I am, and with the help of performances and so on, and that we could you know, come closer to each other that way. And I, yes, I, I you know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite boring as a person, actually. I go to bed early and I, you know, I, um, I read and I, I'm not, um, not uh, f f I don't run around being weird or difficult. It's my, my work does, but not me. <laughs> uh, 
Actually, I'd like you, if you would, uh, to uh, talk about a couple of works that, uh, mm. uh, recent works, um, and uh, they were in your recent exhibition um, at Rodman Hall. And uh, I wonder if you'd mind talking about Plato uh, for to start with. Mm -hmm. Would you? Would you do that? Yes. Um, visually, it's a very simple work. It's. Um, I filmed a um, very large, majestic ferry boat that runs between Stockholm and Helsinki. And uh, I was on the shore and filming this boat moving, moving forward. And, and of course, that's a very kind of a short shoot. The problem was there from the beginning. And also, I didn't think my camera was going to be good enough, which I was surprised to see that my little camera still holds up. Um, um, but I knew from the beginning that I wanted that to become an eternal movement um, that would um, talk about uh, isolation, um, and uh, going away, and um, Plato actually is not about Plato, it's an it's, uh, abbreviation for please leave all tickets on board. And once you read that, you get a better idea of what that work is about. Uh, my mother was very close to dying at that time, and um, I did that work and I also made a work where I was up in, an, in a hot air balloon in Stockholm. I had this need of movement. I, I'm not sure why. That's how it was. Is there anything else you wanted me to talk about in that work? Well, the title It's a one-liner. I love it. It's, sorry. It's a one-liner. <laughs> it may be a one-liner, but it's mesmerizing in the fact that the, the ship never leaves. The ship continues to float past yes. us yes uh, in a kind of effortless sense of well, shall I call it infinity but yes um, you see it's not, always, hmm? it's not always the artist who can explain the work <laughs> you did it much better than I did perhaps you could explain the title um, well Plato is in there in the sense that I've always you know in a simple way, in a simple way, understood Plato when he talks about the glimpse of light that we get from the grotto and looking up, and that's it for us. It's a pessimistic view, but it's also it's true, and therefore it can be quite beautiful. And um, so, this boat to me is the ever, ever moving or ever ent ent the entropy on the boat and that's all we get, kind of. And then, you know, you've given your ticket away, you're in there and you know you're not going anywhere. Maybe it's a metaphor for life in some ways, maybe it's a metaphor for death, I'm not sure. Perhaps a summary of uh, the Republic. Sorry? Perhaps it's a summary of the Republic, Plato's Republic. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a big step to take. <laughs> yeah. Well, my step, not yours. <laughs> so yes. I'll take responsibility. Okay, <laughs> you do that. There's another work as well in that same exhibition, uh, The Waiting Room, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is similarly intriguing. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about The Waiting Room? And I'm, I'm actually curious about the relationship between the sense of I guess you could call it infinity. Uh, certainly if you would stay too long in the waiting room, you start to feel the notion of the infinite. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Plato work, where mm -hmm. again, there's that mesmerizing quality of endlessness, I suppose mm -hmm. you could call it. Um, do you want to talk about, but that's my premise, do you want to talk about the waiting room? Yes, um, uh, both the, they're both white works. They are um, colorless. And that's, uh, that to me is a kind of unreality re related to something that doesn't exist. 
um, and uh, um, the waiting room is actually my latest part of a long series called the Hedda videos and it's always the same performer a Swedish friend of mine who is also an artist and who is my kind of alter ego so she steps in for me so I think on some level I have come to understand that this is a self-portrait in some pathetic way and uh, it's a very awkward situation where um, it's a play in four parts and nothing happens just like on the boat it's, it just falls in on itself and there's also entropy and, and there's an effort huge effort made by this person who we never see because her face is covered and she has a um, she has a white tutu which talks about the feminine um, and she is um, fighting with the uh, her, a chair, and that chair is very difficult to move, but we all know that it isn't. But we kind of, it's that kind of thing where you're, that I like that you, as a viewer, can be willing to sus suspend your disbelief because you see something that you, that you were interested in. And that's why it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't even look like it's heavy, but at the same time, it's, she, she behaves as if it's stuck. She's in the wrong place at the wrong time. She doesn't know where the stage is. Uh, the curtain keeps going up and down. Uh, when the applaud comes, which is just the word, applaud, she's halfway out of the scene, of the mise en scène, but she doesn't know it. So it, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very psychological, very loaded piece. I also find it slightly funny. I hope it is because I hope it is a little funny, but maybe not. I don't know. Some of the bit, she can be very funny. This performer, Andalena Johansson is her name, and uh, I made many works with her, and sometimes they're hilarious. But as I get older, I'm less and less funny, and I think the last this might be the last Hedda video because it's, it's just <laughs> that's it. It's entropy now. I know children love this piece from uh, Rodman Hall. There was a school group there of, uh, um, to, to, to make theater, and they had emulated the costume and uh, were filming themselves in front, of my, in front of my film. So there was something in there for children that they, the bounciness maybe, or the costume. And also, actually, the costume is, um, uh, inspired by some of the uh, modernist uh, dance costumes in the 50s, which is, um, who are those artists? Well, Picasso, but many others who made those outrageous costumes. And there is one costume that is, of course, much more professional and, and elegant. What I've made there is very, very, very pathetic. Uh, but uh, it, it does have it does have a place. Can you not? Yeah. I was very unsure about this work. I wasn't sure to, to show it because I was thinking, how can anyone poss can anyone possibly see something there? But like I said, this, this sometimes without. You were thinking people will just sort of stay around and see something that maybe you don't see either. So it's uh, I guess it's relatively open, open. Although I, I do call it entropy for myself, but it probably is quite open because there's no story, there's no 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 words. Also, come in. I, I come into the scene myself once. Um, I have through a, a, a piece, a plastic piece, arrives arrives on the stage and, and uh, rolls around and, it's, uh, and I pick it up and, and it's not anything that, it's a non-object, it has no meaning whatsoever. So it's also meaningless to come in and pick it up because it doesn't do anything. It's just a gesture of meaningless. I think I heard you a few minutes ago, Gunella, say that you sense a movement in your practice from at least playing the comedic 
uh, to arriving at entropy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to follow that thought along a little bit more? Um, if I may, well, yeah. <clears throat> it strikes me that comedy requires a coherent field within which the comedic can operate. Mm -hmm. Once we verge to entropy, that field has dissipated. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what we get, perhaps melancholy, I'm not sure. Anyway, just to suggest yeah. that. Uh, I, I know what you mean there. It may, I think of Malevich, uh, the Russian painter, who is one of my uh, kind of um, ground figures for in my work. I think he reached entropy quite early, and I, have, I don't think I don't know where he went from there. But he, he just uh, um, perfected a cross, and no one else has been able to do anything like that at all. So that is entropy because it never happened any other time. Yeah. Well, then the, the, at that time you 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 could start talking about abstraction, what that is, and how that. Uh, Expression is a form of research, and then in, in a loss of form, and then maybe a loss of shape and loss of place. And maybe my work, then, in some ways, it's interesting to think of the head of it. There are maybe 15 of them now, I think, that they have gone from extremely lively, where people jump up and down on couches and gold, and they blow soap bubbles, and they're very, you know, you know, there's body involved and and uh, some of them are hilarious for for some people but they're always they are serious to me but they, you know they're, they're all habits there's always a state of mind and after there and uh, the last two there's another of these head of videos in this show called uh, the last dinner I mean my work does speak about the last um, last of everything in this show and uh, the biggest work is called The Last Goodbye. The Big Goodbye, sorry. It's called The Big Goodbye. I realize it should be probably called The Last Goodbye because my mother died shortly after that. And I, I knew she would. But um, um, in, uh, in the other uh, Hedda video, same performer, she is um, um, tilting a, a table that is um, ladled with um, dinnerware all in green and if you look closer you realize it's not a dinner at all it's just like objects but it's very very dinner-like which is also appointed to the bourgeoisie a little bit you know the, and she is very angry and she uh, or she I can't say she so it's, a, it's a creature that has mud in her face and it looks kind of strange you don't see much of her so, so I've created a kind of hole in the middle of this video, and folded it in, in on, on itself. And that's where all this uh, dinnerware ends up going into this middle, and it comes back up and it goes back in. That's really an image of entropy, actually, come to think of it. So those two last ones, I feel that it, that's it for me when it comes to that series. So it's an interesting way to, to think about it, actually. What do you think about uh, Samuel Beckett? Because as you talk, for some reason, I think yes. of Beckett's yes. plays. I, it's, I, it's so evident to me. I forgot to. I forgot to. Uh, I don't even want, in some ways, to talk about it because, of course, uh, Waiting for Godot is uh, one of my other big um, um, cornerstones in my practice. Mm. Strangely enough, it's a. It's, a, it's very, um, I don't know if it's strange, but I just find it endlessly interesting that nothing happens and at the same time a lot happens. And uh, I've seen it many times in different countries and different languages. And I also took my daughter there to see it. She, she thought it was very cool, you know, at a certain age, that's a very cool thing as a kind of uh, existentialism and all that stuff. And so she wanted to go to the theater and we went and after about half an hour she turned to me and said, Mom, 
there's nothing here. You know, so she was so disappointed. I, hadn't, I didn't want to tell her anything because I just wanted her to have her own experience. Yes, uh, that and the, also the Camus the Stranger has um, guided me and I've used that, the last the text from that um, Merso character in some of my work, all related. I'm kind of interested in um, when I first encountered your work, you know, mm -hmm. um, I understood you as working very materially in a sculptural practice or installational practice. Beautiful work. I remember writing about it because I was so struck yes, by it. Yes, you did, and I was very um, happy that you did. And then, of course, you've shifted, I, I'm not say abandoned, but shifted your mm -hmm. practice to uh, what we could call a filmic practice, video, or mm -hmm. uh, very much about the projected image. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the shift from the one to the other. Mm -hmm. Then my immediate thought is the work that you saw is just, um, a work of um, a bit more than 50 breastplates in, in latex, black, blackened, and with white frogs and pearls on them, uh, ha hung on the wall. And you wrote, tried to be comical, and it's that's something I was so struck by that because I had no idea that that's how it could be read. I didn't feel that I could communicate well with that piece. I, I, I was fumbling there for, for a while. When I came to Canada, I was a painter. Um, and uh, and I, I made a couple of big paintings when I arrived in Canada, and I was I was part of a of a collective called the Redhead, and I, I felt that uh, there was no no communication at all. I made very very big paintings, they have eight, 18 feet by 16. Thing. If I make them bigger, are they going to be better and will they communicate better? But it just got worse. So I rolled up that, I, I still have, I rolled that painting up and thought, I have to stop this, this is not working. And I realized, I had realized the power of television by then, and how used people are to the moving image, and I started looking at video. I've, I've, I'd never really thought about video because it's, it used to be a really ugly medium, and it was just not beautiful and it was overly political, overly politicized, which is uh, uh, not what I do. My, my work is um, always political. Like I would say that if my work is any good, it's political because you know there's no excuse to just make work that doesn't have, doesn't have a meaning in society itself. But it's, it's hidden. Uh, so, um, then I went over to do, to do um, objects, and I had a very big studio, so everything got very big there too. That's why I made those 55 plates, and I was extremely ambitious for a while, trying to find uh, a medium. I used wax a lot, and I had some success with it too. I was uh, talking about Swedish textiles, uh, sort of um, ancient... Um, um, symbolic textiles but that were used you know for death and birth so already the theme has always been there for me um, a lot was black and white of that work um, and then in my studio everything grew there too and got bigger and bigger and, and the, the mice came and gnawed on the wax and the latex rotted and and it just became uh, overwhelming for me to be honest, I just felt I'm going to have to close this shop too. So that's what I did, and I abandoned my studio, and then I decided to find another medium. And I was thinking about photography there a bit, but it happened at that very time that the first uh, digital mini camcorder came out was was it, it was affordable, and uh, so I bought one. And I got very interested in it, the versatility of this 
amazing instrument and you know it's just uh, it was like getting an, another arm and um, and then I made it work and it was looked at and enjoyed by a lot of people and it seemed so easy and and uh, so I could I continued and I'm still doing it. I was really in love with that camera. And it was very easy in the beginning. I just, I wanted to think of video as something in a box, almost like a, like a vitrine. Uh, I wanted to maintain this simple feeling of what children would say, what's in the box. And uh, I always tried, and I still do try to use um, my own filters like it could be it could be spit or uh, raspberries or sh filming through glass which also Tarkovsky does in a beautiful way I'm very influenced by his work although I would never even say that I'm near what he does at all um, yeah, and then I got more interested in the other uh, in film, and I started looking at Ingmar Bergman, who you know, someone I wanted to look closely at and examine, which I've done in some of my work. Um, and then my videos also became very big. It, it has happened again. That uh, now I do, I only want to make quite a uh, very big work, and and uh, or I did but now I'm at the end of a very long period of work so now I'm, I'm thinking again about what I'm going to do now in the future one thing that strikes me um, about uh, film or video uh, with respect to painting or uh, even photography mm -hmm. and for sure sculpture mm -hmm. and such uh, is the dimension of storytelling that is possible made possible through this particular medium, or these two mediums, film and video. Uh, is it the storytelling uh, aspect of it, or potential, even if it's not a literal story? Is that, you feel, became so, uh, so attractive? Yes, I think so. I think it was a need to, um, to explain the world in a slightly more clear way and to approach narrative somehow, I'm I'm not I'm I'm a real modernist in my head. I, I was brought up that way in Sweden, also educated that way. But I, I was happy to leave it. And when I came to Canada, I realized that people were just doing whatever they liked in, in film and video. It's all like narrative. It could be well, it was a lot of narrative. And you know, when this new wave came of video, of which I was part, I did make a couple of. Uh, early, uh, totally nar narrative-based works, but I wouldn't say narrative because they were actually became anti-narratives before I ended my destruction of those narratives. I kind of, you know, turned them around and, and uh, I called them kind of anti-films. And, and now I, I do, uh, cut, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the, in the face and, um, I've come to realize that you can, now I feel that a face can also have a story and I'm going closer and closer into trying to probe into, go inside people somehow with their, with their faces and some musicians I've worked with and so on. So that's my take on narrative is I'm, 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 um, I'm against narrative in the sense that the film industry is always narrative. It's so tiring and there's so many lousy stories. I mean, our lives are so endlessly more interesting than any of those films, I think. Even, you know, on a small, you know, on a small scale. And uh, I, I, ne I need to work against uh, narrative uh, commercial film, of course. So it's quite political in that, in that sense. That, uh, and then we have the media, the media world, and the advertising here. So that's where the misbehavior comes in. Where if you, if I film a, f a woman or a person, they need to be very, to be very strange and not at all attractive. So they can never ever be seen as advertising. 
I actually want to come back, uh, this is backtracking a little bit, um, Gunilla, mm -hmm. uh, back to the question of events or circumstances that led you to think that art would be a possibility for you. Uh, and I seem to remember that uh, there were, you had relatives who were themselves artists, mm -hmm. uh, and this can be a powerful motive. Do you want to reflect on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I come from a family of um, that produced one of Sweden's most prominent painters, uh, Ernst Josephson, and um, and that was enough for. Well, that's a, that's, that's the Jewish part. My my father was from a Jewish family, so that's that's that's. Uh, so when I grew up, this idea of being an artist was completely abstract to us. It's like you have professions, you have whatever you do, but you don't. Being an artist is not what our family does because we have one already. And <laughs> and he's so he's so great, so like you know you can't even touch on it. And it was also pa patriarchal and conservative family I grew up in. And uh, and uh, it wasn't. It sounds crazy, but I don't think that my sister and I were were especially encouraged to become artists. And for me, it was a question of I was led into um, into um, academia and took a degree in social sciences and worked socially for a bit, which I think has helped me a lot for my for my practice. Actually, I think. It's, probably a good idea for artists to not go directly to art school. And that's very common in Sweden that you are in your thirties when you start art school. And, um, and uh, so that was, um, so when I started having my, I had my lonely moments of nostalgia for the infinite, it had nothing to do with being an artist in the world. And it, it, it took me, it took me to move to Canada, actually, to... Uh, my education is, is, is uh, from Sweden, a long education. But um, for an MFA in, uh, at the Stockholm University of Art and Design. And uh, then I moved to Canada and... Um, uh, it's just... Uh, it, I, you know, I was so stunned by the openness of the, of the uh, at that time in the 80s, of the, uh, of the art scene, the propositions were there, the approximations of all kinds, you know, and modernism, modernism that I grew up, had, had in art school was kind of n n not in the picture, which I was, which was, you know, modernism to me is a male dominating field altogether, in, you know, even in what we grew up in our buildings and and our teaching methods, everything was, you know, based on that. So coming here was uh, when I forgot about my relative and uh, liberated myself. But it wasn't in painting. It wasn't going to be in painting. It was going to be in another media, which I think was a great relief to my father. At least that wasn't painting. But what happened is that I've made a work now of uh, the masterpiece of my relative is called Neck and the Naked Man, and the Nix, the water Nix. And um, I wanted to make that painting in video just for the hell of it and for maybe um, uh, repeating a certain history that I tell you about. Uh, so I went to Sweden and asked, uh, Sweden and asked my cousin if he wanted to be naked, and uh, he did, and and then we found, or we couldn't find the waterfall, so we went to the archipelago and created our own waterfall with some people who were carrying buckets of water from the from the sea and pouring it behind Nekken. and uh, he, he and Nekken, my Nekken is a is an older person with. Um, a mustache and has very little to do. It's a very pathetic neck and actually and badly filmed, almost like per I want to think it's purposely purposely filmed badly because the situation wasn't so good. 
but uh, I, I've, I've made five versions of this now and I have submitted to many places I've never shown it uh, but I'm very fond of it and it, it was um, I was close once to showing it in Sweden but uh, the painting by Josephson was uh, refused in the Paris uh, Spring Salon, and then uh, he sh he applied to he donated or wanted to donate this painting, this big painting, to the National Museum in Stockholm, and they refused it. So I have I applied to uh, the Swedish Institute in Paris to show it, and they refused it. <laughs> so now I th I'm I, I'm going to donate it to to the National Museum and see what happens. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm abusing myself a bit with this piece. That's a performance if there ever was one. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes, my cousin was very happy to do it. He felt absolutely liberated and uh, it changed him, he felt. And, and the, many of my, the people I worked with, the same people almost all the time, are very good friends of mine and they are always happy with the results which is a, which is a gift actually yeah. I have what might be a curious question but I can't help myself asking it uh, Vanilla. Um, uh, you have a long relationship with um, Louis de Soto mm -hmm. uh, another artist mm -hmm. um, though of course a writer and a painter mm -hmm. a painter mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm struck by the, the fact that you have this relationship uh, which branches between the visual arts and writing uh, novels, mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm curious to what extent literature, and of course especially perhaps uh, the discussions that you must have with uh, Lewis mm -hmm. on, on literature, mm -hmm. um, apart from lying in the grass and watching the clouds go by. Um, I'm, I'm curious what, to what extent literature plays a part in your, in your life. Mm -hmm. It's important, literature is important for you. Books are very important and um, yeah. not often American or Canadian literature. I, and because I was already 38 when I came to Canada, my my, my canon, literature canon, is, was then more European, uh, Swedish, which is a very small market, but you know, big enough for, for me. And it's very, very wonderful social, re social realism uh, literature, uh, a school in Sweden of literature that's very, very important for me. Um, and, um, I, I, I always read, and, and it's like, that's, a, that's, a real, that's an other reality, actually, for me. That, that's a, and all dreams is another reality, that's a third level. But that's the one I like the least, because it's, uh, it's, uh, you have no power over it whatsoever, and it can be really difficult. But literature is, is there, it's, it's not like life, because, you know, it's just you can create the ending as you like. And uh, the propositions for how to live, and the characters, and the people, humanity is in literature, of course, is extremely important. Much more important for me than film, actually. And um, uh, there again, Lewis and I have many discussions about narrative and linearity, and uh, um, we are very different in the sense that my work is very experimental, and he, he's, his is not. He, he really believes in writing a clear, clear literature that is simple, but of course, uh, high literature. And uh, um, I don't know why I like his narratives, probably because I like him. But uh, they don't have good, usually they have tragic endings. His books are sad also. We have, we have similarities in our 
psyche. Melancholy so and color. We are still friends, yes, melancholy. I'd like to turn to the, the question um, uh, related to how artists work in the world, mm -hmm. uh, Vanilla. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let's look at the question of the curatorial uh, embrace, mm -hmm. uh, how an artist relates to the uh, means by which work is disseminated through institutions, big or small. Um, do you have any thoughts about curating or how curating has worked with respect to your work and whatever reflections you might have on that? It's a complex uh, question for me, mm -hmm. um, which um, Um, I mean, a, a, a curator is is a person for me that works in an institution usually, and who is um, um, choosing art for exhibitions in these institutions. It could actually it could be a hospital. It could be a school, or it could be a gallery or a museum. Um, we actually, when I grew up, we had curators in our schools who also took care of our mental health if we had problems. So for me, a curator has a very, and I think it has many other meanings. And now, curator is, is the people who are now artists. That's the, 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 the curator is the new artist, sort of. That's how it's become now. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, 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 if we're going to have curation like that, I think I would trust artists to be curators. I don't think I, I think I could. I'm not interested in curating at all myself, or I've never thought about it actually. But I, I think the, um, the, the, the kind of they are part of the bureaucracy for me a bit, and they kind of stop you. They're there to stop you in the door. That's bad thing to say. And um, they are sometimes pretty uh, self-important and uh, uh, young and don't know, from my point of view, enough uh, history, art history, geography, whatever you need to know in order to sort of pre create big, enormous statements about other people's work. I mean, that's a very complicated, complex job. Um, but I, I, it was especially one time a few years ago, I was so we were sitting with a group of people close to Gladstone, and I, th I thought they were artists, but I, I understood eventually, as, as a talking, I didn't really know anybody and I was listening. They were talking about over my head or some other place, other things, and it dawned on me, they're curators, and they're here to talk about that, and they just moved over here and there, and the places, and they kind of, uh, had a completely different discussion that was not about art, but about, about that. And it sounded almost like it could be about anything. Once we pass the gatekeeper um, and uh, the work is, is uh, available, um, we have the role of the critic. And I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, criticism uh, today as you've experienced it. Kind of mm -hmm. When it comes to critic, critics for um, art critics for um, for uh, daily newspapers and so on, it's uh, I suppose they're there to report. They're more for talking about this work that would make people come in, and I don't see any reason why that would be a negative criticism because that's that's uh, wouldn't serve the the purpose. In fact, I don't think that any criticism, any art criticism, should have anything that would hurt the artist ever. Because artists are, do, everything we do is kind and doesn't hurt anybody. So I don't see any reason why we would be, you know, or why we would be hurt by anybody. So I think if you don't like the work, don't write about it. And that could be, you could say, then, but then you have the analytical writing is different. Because then you've kind of surpassed the idea of, of criticism. 
And that's when it becomes really interesting, and I really, really like that kind of writing and that kind of uh, critique. I don't, haven't had many of those personally, or myself, but a couple of catalogues with essays and so on, which I really like to read. And I have felt well understood the times it's happened. So I have a milder relationship to art critics than I have to curators. Because they are creators. I'm going to throw another quote at you uh, from yourself, uh, Gunella. Mm -hmm. The art market and the art star system for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, leading on from that, um, what your thoughts are on the art system. Well, the art star is easy to talk about because, I mean, it's, it's boring to have any kind of star that's superstars of any kind, superheroes or film stars. I mean, I find myself more interesting, actually, and most of the people I know. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this to be, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think that uh, uh, this kind of phenomenon of art star is a modern phenomenon that has to do with um, money and that um, are conspiracies between museums, galleries, and writers actually often. So it's kind of a serious phenomenon in some ways. And there's far too much money involved there, and also what museums buy, and and uh, I'm not too trusting when it comes to uh, the art systems. Um, I'm not sure what kind of people are involved. Which are, uh, I'm not sure about what kind of business it is. And I'm a little afraid of it, and. I'm not very good with self-promotion in the sense that I'm maybe, I'm maybe I'm the cringing kind, maybe I'm afraid of being hurt, maybe I um, feel hopeless because I won't be understood on, a, on that scale. Or, but you know, I've been, you know, I've been uh, in some of these places and I've won you know, the big institutions, so I've had shows there and I've had uh, very good experiences here in Canada from from art institutions when I've had my shows. Um, but how it is on the level of getting up there and having worked an entire life on on something that is becoming very good and at the same time not being considered um, as artist whose work you buy, the institution buys, you start, I start to wonder what the, 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 the motifs and who's involved and, and um, tax reasons and you know, it's, it's very, I find it, I, I wish I had a much more clear and more aggressive uh, look on it. I'm, I, I sometimes feel like I'm not even professional because I can't handle that. That uh, that side, and I, yeah, it's, um, it's it's always been male dominated for me in my life at my age now also, and very cliched, click clicked and so on. Yeah. It's hard to talk about because it is should be part of your should be part of my practice, right? But it, 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 it's a sore point because, I mean, you know, it's just starting from, from zero, from square one each time. I'm, you know, I'm gonna be 17 in a while. And it's like, I'm still, you know, knocking on the door when my hat in my hand, and it will probably always be that way for me. I hope it changes. I hope, I hope artists take care of their own I think that we can. We have to stop having uh, um, museums um, where you pay to go in and look at art. You have to open up these institutions to much more art, and they need to become like cathedrals of culture that's free for everybody, and. We have to stop judging artists as good or bad, and I think society, basically, like in Norway, 
should give us uh, should support artists, should be able to afford it, and uh, it has been proved that it's possible. So you know you, you can argue that that the, the granting system, which we probably will talk about, is also part of that dis where I kind of had distrust and having been in a couple of juries where I find it difficult to to state my view because people are so sure about their choices and sometimes I'm not sure if their motifs are clean or not. So I think, yeah, I think in the future we'll have uh, a world with much more art and uh, and uh, um, but you know the question will always be quality, I suppose. But you know, I want to kind of oppose it. It's, it's hard to think about how you could do that. Like if you have an art, if you have an art uh, salary, like in Norway, all you have to do is um, you have to show. You have to show that you show. You have to have a list every year, and then you you have to send in one or two works, and then. So it goes year by year, but but it's not. There's not a big requirement for it. It's not a huge salary. It's maybe like a pension, you know. But and then you also support artists in their studios. You you can uh, in Sweden we can if you can create your own group like three people, and then you apply for um, rent um, um, reduction, which is a system that's in place, and that should re absolutely be in place here. The parallel system in Canada has, is the best in the world in many ways. Uh, so we haven't talked about that, but I don't know enough about it to really talk about that. I wasn't here when, the, when it was very important. I think it's a bit diluted now, isn't it? It's, not, it's changing. Well, of course, the whole system is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Perhaps uh, rather notable is if you think back to the 1970s when the parallel system was developed, mm. uh, artist run as it's now known, uh, that um, uh, at the time uh, it seemed very much uh, an avant gardist gesture in what was uh, relatively speaking a wilderness of art distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, it's very different. Young yeah. artists are forming their own private galleries. Uh, and uh, so the, the parallel system has diversified and expanded exponentially, you might say, uh, to the point where it, it uh, works around and with the official uh, institutions, mm -hmm. long-standing official institutions. Uh, and um, it's, it's harder to talk about the parallel system any longer in and of itself because it's it has expanded so exponentially, and I think that this is certainly, I, I would say, a very positive development. Uh, I would say that too. I mean, so there's, there's a good story here, and a good. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is the only model that actually exists mm -hmm. anywhere in the in the world that we know. Mm -hmm. So that's something that that has to be many people, that, including yourself, have been involved in starting and so on, which is a fantastic thing in Canada. And I'd heard about it before I moved here. And I have shown uh, through out the country on in in places like that. So that's where curators are also involved, but they are in on the on that institutional level. In um, but also where it's like some there seems to be a, um, a lot a, a, a transparency in those. Um, in, those, in that system, I want to believe that, that it's not corrupt. So it's always had transparency, which is comfortable to think about. I have uh, two last questions, uh, you know. Um, the first is, uh, it's always difficult to know how to define this, but I'm going to use a tried and true word. Do you think, or do you have a feeling that there's a, a zeitgeist at work that your work responds to? Uh, and I know that this is a, a difficult subject because uh, one person's zeitgeist is different from another person's. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm quite happy to hear a, 
a personal response to the question mm -hmm. of whether that you feel it's a, a common discourse or a, a dominant discourse or a, or a discourse that seems in play, uh, that uh, you feel your work uh, most especially attaches itself to. Um, yes, I, if we talk about Zeitgeist as being a truthful um, kind of mirror of, of the contemporary art world, and not anything that has been formulated by gallery owners or art stars then I think I'm quite comfortable in the world that way. And I often work with younger artists and they seem to understand my work. So I think that's a sign of, of um, actually I feel I'm more inside, I've, it's more, I'm more in the sidecast now than I ever, than I was earlier. Uh, where I did the same amount, same kind of work, but it was too weird, you know, 20 years ago. It was just too strange. And now things are that there are people, young artists today, who are making very strange work, and I'm very comfortable with that. And I, I like to see it, I like that development. There's much fear. I mean, you might not think this, but when I move around a bit in the world, also I see very strange uh, expressions, and I'm interested. I like to see things I've never seen before, I suppose. And uh, yeah, I make them too. I'm always curious about this question of reality uh, mm -hmm. and what is real, to put it differently. Uh, what is substantial that we feel uh, uh, we know when we see it or experience it? Uh, and of course, there's that wonderful antique word, authenticity, that uh, was coined uh, to attempt to uh, give a, a name to this uh, feeling, but the feeling probably extends much more than the word authenticity itself. But I'm curious whether, um, with yourself, uh, whether this notion of what is real or authentic uh, could be constituted in uh, the uh, subversive quality of transgression and revelation that you have cited uh, as important to you. Uh, so, the question, mm. yes. Um, the, the authenticity uh, that's, that's not interesting in art to me. The authenticity is interested in, in, in when people are authentic, when you, when you, can, when you can know each other, but in in art, uh, authenticity to me belongs to the old um, uh, male-dominated dominated art world for hundreds of years, and where authenticity has been questioned and talked about, and and the the value is uh, really the money comes into the picture when it comes to authenticity. Um, I don't find that. I, I mean, I've. I've remade my relative's uh, neck, and that tells you enough about what I think of authenticity. It's like I totally, you know, broke it down. I like, I like to subvert it. Actually, I don't. Yeah. But what was the, what was the first part of the question? I'm curious about this. These two terms, transgression and revelation, oh. and whether these words might suggest a channel by which we can understand something that is real. Well, I, I think in order to, you have to investigate uh, the world in order to find the truth. And of course, uh, transgression and and uh, subversion is very is part are are important in this research. Um, they're like tools for carpentry, and I think it's very very important. I'm not sure that that was important until about 20 years ago. I'm not sure, and I, I, it, I think if feminism has certainly pushed this. Uh, forward, this um, uh, questioning forward in a very healthy way. And uh, I'm kind of proud to be part of it. And I, I kind of say it to hell with authenticity, actually. Come to think of it. You can quote me anytime. Still cut my pieces away. 
take my drawings, whatever, I don't care. <laughs>